Holz gekocht. <laughs> Make me feel old. <laughs> And she's just, did you recently get your doctorate? Or? I did. I just Woo! finished. I defended it. You. So you. I'll let her give you more info, but the, you're in for a treat because I was. She brought my favorite bird, Lurch. <laughs> Lurch. <laughs> Take it away, Pat. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. And I am. I do work at Milford, Milford Nature Center, which is over at Milford Lake. How many of you have been there? A few. Okay. Yeah. If not, I thought you may have been there. I thought I'd just go through, and I'll have to keep this short because I was uh, practicing. Not. I was talking to a gal that works with me, and she says, well, you do have a tendency to get sidetracked, so <laughs> you better go fast. So I'm going to try to go fast, but I guess I do have to push the button. Um, so I'll just say, uh, just a reminder, we're open Monday through Friday from 9 to 4.30. That's year-round, so this time of year and in the summer as well. But in starting in April, we are open seven days a week, and we have Saturday and Sunday hours from 1 to 5. And... Um, so, and hatchery tours, we are right next door to the Milford Fish Hatchery, so if you've never been out to see the hatchery in full swing, uh, come visit us in April. Um, you can get a hatchery tour at 1.30, you don't have to call us in advance, just show up. But we are hatching all of the walleye. We start our walleye production in April. Um, this year we'll be producing, I don't know, anywhere from 40 to 50 million walleye fry in about a, six, about a three week period of time, three or four weeks. So if you wanna go and see the walleye, and see how we do this process. Um, come over and visit us in April. Um, you can catch all that. So the, my building, the Milford Nature Center, was completed in 1988. This is the backside. You can see a couple of the raceways for the hatchery as well. And this is what it looks like 30 years later. So it has been a while. Um, and we have all kinds of displays, you know, representing Kansas wildlife. So. Um, you look at the touch tables and the reptiles and amphibians. We've got some screech owls inside, and this is our prairie dot. Well, there's a couple of snakes on display, lots of snakes on display. So if you like snakes, come see us. And then we have prairie dogs, and, and they live in this fabulous little house that our tunnel system on the wall. So pretty cool. And then lots of fish and other things to see. We have an, well, some of those two showcase pieces of the Nature Center are these large aquatic and terrestrial dioramas. Um, they are amazing things, uh, hand-painted, and uh, the displays, you're going to find a lot of things. You can come and see us every time, and you'll find something different in the diorama you didn't see before. I've actually had people say, how much water does that hold? And it's like, well, it doesn't hold any water. It's all, but it's been uh, done by Chase Studios. He was the exhibit designer for both these dioramas. So this is the terrestrial diorama, and it has the prairies, marshes, and woodlands. In it. We have a couple of displays, one on waterfowl in the state and, and one on sport fish in the state. So come, you can take a look at those while you're there. But then I'll say, you know, the birds of prey, we have birds of prey outside and that's what some of the birds I brought with me tonight are from our bird of prey display. We sort of specialize in raptors and uh, so we have a lot of raptors we can talk to you about and show you. We also have a butterfly house, which is a seasonal exhibit. It's not climate control. We open it on Mother's Day, and I guarantee butterflies in there from Mother's Day to Labor Day. But beyond that, <laughs> it's it just depends. Um, and uh, so, and that has I could tell you lots and lots and lots of stories about the butterfly house. It, it seemed like it would be a pretty straightforward and simple affair to start with. No, <laughs> not at all. Um, so it's been one of the biggest challenges I think I've ever had to try to overcome. But but we do manage to, to have some, we set it up for three species of butterflies, monarchs, painted ladies, and black swallowtails, because those are all natives. We don't import any, we don't get any, any exotics, because then you have to get involved with the USDA. That's not fun. Yeah. So anyway, we also have a bobcat display. We have a couple of bobcats that are there, a permanent residents of the Nature Center, and you can come and peek at them. We have a nature playground and a picnic shelter attached to it. They're available for picnics and, and groups to use. Um, then the hatchery is next door. And anytime you visit, you can walk around the raceways and look in the raceways. Uh, but as I said, the hatchery tours are on Saturdays and Sundays at 1.30 in April and May, or excuse me, yeah, April and May. But if you want a hatchery tour with a group outside of that time, you, you can schedule with us. It's just that we only offer them on the weekends in April and May for without calling in advance or anything. And we have a nature trail that, that goes around the outlet pond uh, close to us. We also do programs. 
and uh, schedule you know, with groups were free uh, for the programs, um, but you do have to have them scheduled in advance. We work with lots of school groups and 4-H and other groups. And so approximately about every year, we do about 16,000, 15 to 16,000 uh, attendees to the programs that we do. And then we have a couple of special events. This one on the, on the uh, left is Eagle Days, and on the right is a Monster Mist by Moonlight, which is our Halloween event. It's on the trail. We introduce you to some of the creatures that are scared. You, people are usually have a, a bad opinion of when it comes to Halloween creatures. Um, so, and then we also are part of one of the events that we do is called an Eco Meet. Um, it started at Milford, but we have expanded it, so it goes throughout the state. And actually, here in Salina, um, Lakeside or Lakewood Nature Center does an eco meet, and so Brian has worked with us on this, and, and it's part of the same program. But it's a quiz type program uh, with high school kids uh, exploring the you know native plants and animals of Kansas. Um, here in 19, uh, 2009, we added a building called the Starboard Education Building. It gave us a classroom space, and it also became space for our wildlife rehabilitation. We're one of the few wildlife rehabilitation facilities in Kansas, and uh, we definitely uh, cover a, an area that's greater than eight, or eight to 10 counties here in, in this area around us. Um, so I just thought, these, now the next question, these next pictures are all cute. These are all put in here for the cute factor, okay? So things that we've rehabilitated, things that we get, and, uh, and I'll go through some more here. This is cuteness overload here. Here's a baby beaver, and we've got to let him swim in the sea. Now, by the way, beavers are quite hard to rehabilitate. They, they have a, a, a huge family structure, and they stay with mom and dad for two years, and it's not an easy thing, but anyway, they're cute. This is my favorite. Oh, have you ever seen anything? A baby skunk. They are the cutest thing. And they go, <laughs> um, and that's when they explore the world. Here's dinner time for some baby squirrels. We get quite a few of those, as you can imagine. There's a baby bobcat. Uh, possums. Who loves a possum? You should. Everyone should love a possum. They eat lots of ticks. Remember that? So, uh, but the one thing about possums is you don't just get one at a time. Mom has 13 nipples, and so she can have 13 babies. So you never get just one possum. You get six or eight or 13. And uh, so they become quite, I think last year we did between 40 and 50 baby possums. <gasps> yeah. Uh, but here they are. They do grow up, okay? And we can't let them go. Um, uh, we've had coyotes come in our way. We've had baby mink. That's pretty cute. Um, um, so then, of course, there's the, the release part, the preconditioning, getting them used to you know finding food. On that's the hardest part. You can raise them. You can give them formula, but boy, switching them from formula to finding their own food or picking up food on their own is always our challenge. But once we get them to that point, then we we can get them out there and let them go. Um, we've worked with a lot of bats. Bats are another favorite. We've got a big soft spot for bats. Um, never want to see any bats needlessly killed. And so we, this was a whole colony that was ripped out of an attic and brought to us. But we were fortunately able to release them in a different place. This is a, a bat box that was, uh, we work with Fort Riley a lot. And so we had a, a new bat home out there that we uh, put these bats in. Um, this is a picture of our flight pen so that we have a flight pin that we can use for conditioning birds for release. There's a great horned owl in that flight pin. But uh, I do want to say a little bit about this. This is one of the most exciting things I think um, I've been involved with in a long time. We, you know, one of the biggest, you get all these animals that come in to your uh, rehabilitation center and you want to, oh yes, they're cute, and oh yes, I, but they're a lot of work. And my new mantra is whenever things come in the door, I'm like, put it back. Put it, back. put it back, put it back, put it back, we don't want it, put it, I don't say that, I don't say we don't want it, but I say put it back, but, and, and that has been what we have really made a commit, it's a lot harder to do, it's not easy um, to put things back where they belong, it's hard to convince the finder that that's the best thing for the animal, but this particular case um, is a story about an eagle nest that happened in 2016, um, there was a nest, it's in, it was in Tuttle Creek, it was near Tuttle Creek. This tree had been struck by lightning and it was on fire. And it had been smoking 
and we knew it was smoking, but there's not much you can do about it. And we were just hoping for the best. We were hoping that the fire would extinguish itself, it was smoldering from the base of the tree, and that everything would be all right. But that is not what happened. So the tree collapsed on a Friday morning. Um, we had known it had been smoking since about Monday. And there were two tricks brought in to us. Uh, here they came with two tricks in a bag. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service were like, oh, this can't be good. And so <laughs> here they were, and they said, yeah, the nest fell down today. And I said, we're going to put them back. And they're like, well, how? And I said, we're going to put them back. So I called. I started with Westar. You have to know somebody in the power companies. Uh, they're great. Westar Energy, which is now Evergy, um, they have been a great partner with us in putting a lot of these birds back. And so we got uh, them on the phone, and, and we made a lot of phone calls, and we found a crew, and they said, sure, we'll try it. So they started. You can see this in the bottom corner there. They're constructing. We um, picked a new tree. It wasn't like the tree that the nest had been in. Uh, it was an oak tree, believe it or not, but it was the closest tree that we could get our bucket truck to and have access to and, and make this work. So we were, hope, we were hoping that this was gonna be the right thing to do. So that you can see that nest they built. Um, before we put the chick back, there were two chicks, um, but one of the chicks in the fall had injured itself. It actually had broken its back. We took it to K-State and there was no way of fixing that. So that chick uh, couldn't be put back, it was euthanized. But this chick, there was a surviving chick, and we got it banded. Here we are banding it before we put it back. You can see the bucket truck, you can see where the nest, the new nest construction is. We're all looking as they put the eagle back up in the nest. There's Junior in his new house, and he looks pretty happy, and, and he's got a great view. And uh, <laughs> we're thinking, oh, this is awesome. And this is about five o'clock in the evening now. and. Um, so we're thinking, and, and if you've ever been around when eagles are being banded, I banned eagles with U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and the eagles, the adults don't bother you. They fly around and they, they make some noise and they watch you, but they never come and try to get at you or anything like that. They're not, they just sit and wait. And these two adult birds were around. They were in the area, they were flying around. We watched them, we thought as soon as we get out of here, they're going to come down and they're going to take care of Junior here. Well, that's not what happened, unfortunately, but it took about, so we waited all that night. We thought, oh, that's not good. They, she, they never came back. The next morning, usually early in the morning, the eagles are most likely to come back to the nest and feed the young. They didn't come, but around noon, this is what we saw. And there's the adult coming back, and they came, they both came back and, and of course, tended that chick, and they ended up successfully fledging that chick. And here is even more exciting, year two, 2017, that's what the nests look like. They've been back 2018 and 2019, so we're hopeful that 2020 they're going to be back in the same nest. So uh, that has been one of our, our greatest, uh, great success. But it also spurred us into, I'll show you a couple of other times uh, where we put some babies back. So here we had some great horned owls that uh, the, the tree, the nest, fell down and so we got our great old basket there. That's an old laundry basket, by the way. And, but here we tried something and it works sometimes and sometimes it doesn't. One of these chicks is not like the others because it came from another nest. We had just gotten it in the day before and we thought, well, it's about the same age. Great horned owls aren't all that picky and we thought, we're gonna stick it in there. So we stuck it in there with the other two chicks and we told the, home, the landowner there that if they had any, you know, call us if something one is out of the nest. Well, the next morning, they kicked the one out that wasn't theirs. <laughs> so that one didn't work, but the other two were fine. Um, so here's a barred owl nest that this part of the tree had fallen down, and we put the, we, all it took was a ladder and some wire to get it back up there, but you could see it, or I can't probably see the, the little piece of the bark just fell off, and it, there was a hole under there. And so I think there's a better picture. Now, you, there you can oh, yeah. see how we, we got the baby back in there and we, we, tie, we wired this back up. We got a bunch of wire and put it back around there to hold it back up and got, got that guy back in there. Barn owls, we get a lot of barn owl calls and they nest in some pretty strange places. Um, this is one, they were in a, in a piece of equipment here. That wasn't gonna work out very well. Um, and we got them put back and. 
So we were able to kind of relocate them into a, we used a handy dandy pet quarter, but it worked out. Um, there's another nest. This was near Emporia. They were, uh, ended up having to, um, uh, they, four of the chicks had already left the nest. It just Junior was the last one there. And, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that, but birds, owls have asynchronous hatching. So they, they lay all their eggs, but there's a day or two between each egg being laid. So there's always an older chick and a younger chick. And so when the youngest chick was still left, that was the one that was in the inappropriate place. So anyway, that was a good one. Um, but this one, I'll tell you, this is probably one of the other most bizarre stories I can tell you. Aren't those just a picture of cuteness <laughs> or ugliness, whatever? Um, so we got, so Jetmore, Kansas, it's a long ways away. It's near gone, okay? Jetmore's a long ways away. So this guy pulls into a, park, a hotel parking lot in, in Manhattan, Kansas. And he's got this big trailer. And on this trailer is, is a sign. It looks like a scoreboard, like from a, from a football field or something. It's just a big sign on the back of this trailer. But it's hissing. <laughs> and this guy doesn't know it. Or, and so somebody goes into the hotel and says, there's a hissing noise coming from the sign out there. And go out there, call Animal Control in, in Manhattan. And, and they go, we find out there's an entire nest of barn owls inside this sign. And the guy had bought this sign in Jetmore, Kansas. <laughs> Turns out it was on an old racetrack. It was an old lap counter for a racetrack. And it had been, the city had sold it. The city of Jetmore had sold it, and the guy had finally come to get it. And they just took it down. And nobody knew there was a barn owl nest in it. And so, and I said, we're going to put it back. <laughs> and, and that was a lot of work, but it worked. I mean, it was a good thing. So I called, I said, I called Jet. How hard can this be, right? <laughs> I call Jet Moore and I get a hold of this lady and I said, I have this really strange story. I said, who, what, what, where could this have come from? And she said, I'll call you back. I think I know. She calls me back in about 15, 20 minutes. She says, yes, I know exactly where that sign was and I know when it was sold and the guy came and picked it up. And so I said, so who's in charge of, you know, maintenance or who could I talk to? And she put me in charge of talk to this guy in their city department. And I called him up and I said, look, if I bring these back, could you, do you have a post hole, you know, do you have a hole digger and can you place a post? He goes, yeah, I suppose so. I said, okay. And if I bring a box, can we put the box on the pole and we can put the pole right back where this sign was? He goes, yeah. So I drove out there by the time I got there. But so he had put the post up. He set the post. And um, we, oops, we, uh, so you can see us, the truck. And when I got out there, I had this crazy idea that maybe somebody could drive out there and kind of check on them every once in a while. <laughs> once I got there, I'm like, no, there's no way. And we get this pole, and we put this box up on them. You can see us putting the box up on the top of the pole. And we put the guys in there. I put a bunch of mice in there in case mom didn't come back. And I was really doubting myself because there, once I sealed the lid on this, it was either going to work or it wasn't going to work. And, and there was no going back and checking on them later and making sure. But good news because this guy, he was out there like two days later and he saw Mama fly out of the box. Oh. So she did come back. We had put little spots on them so we could tell them apart. That's why they have pink oh, and blue on them. <laughs> <laughs> they have pink and blue and other colors so we could tell them apart. And, um, so anyway, that was one of our, uh, one of my favorite uh, stories that we got those barn owls back where they belonged and Mama's Using, I don't know if she's still using the box. I kind of hope she is. And then bats, baby bats. We actually end up with a lot of baby bats, and they're pretty dang tiny. And uh, so they give you an idea. But uh, this is a, we had a nest. Well, we ended up putting the babies back in this uh, and uh, putting them back, and Mama came back. But you can reunite bats with the with their babies, and you can reunite a lot of animals with their babies, and that by far is the way to go. But anyway, this was just a few of the stories I thought you might enjoy, and that is all of, I, of the slides I brought um, to talk about. But uh, so yes, rehab is a, is a really big part of what we do, and because of the rehab, we have a lot of the raptors that we can use then for programs. Either they are non-releasable for one reason or another, oftentimes, they're imprinted or sometimes they have you know, wing injuries and they can't 
can't be released. So I brought a couple of those birds with me tonight, kind of to, I guess we could turn on the lights now, and I can introduce you to a couple of the birds I brought with me. So what was my logic in the birds I brought? Well, there might not be any logic, but I brought the owl because it has a heart-shaped face. And what month is this? <laughs> oh, no. Monday, right? So let's see. I hear he's in a mood, though. Before I, uh, my uh, assistant, she said, he's in a mood, she's in a mood. I don't know how she's going to be. Oh, great. <laughs> And I, I like to call this owl the Cadillac of owls. Um, this is a barn owl, the true barn owl. There are lots of owls that are called barn owls, but this is the owl that uh, is the actual barn owl. So you notice he's got a very heart-shaped face, very long legs, and, and a lot of white on the front of, of this bird. Now this bird I is actually a she, uh, so help me not say he. Sometimes I get back and forth. Um, so a male would have a lot, would have a pure white breast and wouldn't have the spots that you see, the, like the flecks of pepper on the, on the breast know. there. So um, this is our female. And uh, what, you know, owls in general, we talk about birds of prey. Of course, what makes you a bird of prey? Two things make you a bird of prey. The two things that um, set you apart are your talons. So these talons that are used for grabbing a hold of their food. So we can look, this is from an eagle. And uh, you're welcome to come down here and, and look at this uh, bald eagle foot. So birds of prey have talons on their feet and they have sharp beaks that are designed for tearing. So they have a, a point on their beak that comes down to a sharp point. So if you look inside a bird's mouth, you notice there aren't any teeth. Birds don't have teeth. Teeth have been reduced in the bird. Um, and believe it or not, you know, your teeth and jaw structure and muscles that support your jaw actually adds quite a bit of weight to you. So if you want to be lighter weight, uh, reducing your teeth and having a beak do all the job of your teeth um, is a good thing if you're a bird. So the birds, uh, so she doesn't, so that, that's what makes them a bird of prey. Now, owls, when you get your bird book out, you guys are all birders, you know that the owls are not right after the hawks and the eagles, right? There's a difference. There's a, there's, 20 pages or 50 pages in between the two groups because owls are not just simply nighttime versions of a hawk or an eagle. Owls are very different and everything about an owl is different. The shape of their body, the way they, um, and so owls have what we say, we say eagles and hawks and owls have convergent evolution. They, can, they develop the same tools because they do the same job. So a raptor, uh, so a, a hawk or an eagle that eats using talons is the same as, a, as an owl that uses its talons to catch its prey, its mice. So um, this is an example of converging evolution. So what's different about an owl? Owls have a couple of things that to, to really highlight that nighttime vision. They are nighttime, they're nocturnal, they hunt at night, so they have eyes that are designed for seeing at night. Their eyes are packed full of rods, okay, inside your eyes you have both rods and cones. Cones let you see color, rods let you pick up light. <coughs> Get rid of most of your cones and you can have a lot more rods in your eye and you can see a lot more, you can detect a lot more light. Doesn't mean they can't see color, but they've given up a lot of their cones in their eyes in order to see, to have rods to see light. So how well can an owl see? Um, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to put in terms that we can really understand. But there is one study done that said an owl can spot a mouse three to four football fields away. So that's like 400 yards, okay? They can do that in the light produced by a single candle, or one candle full of light, okay? So that is not very much light. And so on the darkest night, you don't need a moon out. All you, you can get by with lots of just starlight. You can see just fine. But besides having that great, oh, and everybody asks, well, why do you have a grapefruit on your 
Well, that's because if you were built like an owl, so here's the skull of an owl. Um, the other thing you can notice about the eyes, you see how big they are. You also notice there's a bony ring around those eyes, and the eye is stuck looking forward. So if an owl wants to look over here, he has to turn his head to look over here. He doesn't have the ability to roll his eyes in his socket like we do. There's no room for muscles. Okay? There's no room for the muscles to be attached, so the owl has to turn his head. He can turn his head um, 270 degrees, which is three-fourths of a circle, uh, farther than any other animal. But if you were built like an owl, you would have to have eyes the size of a grapefruit. Oh, wow. Compared to your skull. So if you, were, if you were in the same proportions as an owl is to its body, then you'd have big great big eyes. All right? Um, the one, so the barn owl actually belongs to a little bit different group of owls. It's the only member we have in North America. And to look at this owl, his eyes aren't going to look near as big as they would on, say, a gray horned owl or a barred owl or something like that. Um, they still have that great acuity. They still have the larger, uh, lots more rods in their eyes. But their eyes, they are stuck looking forward, but they are not as large compared to their body as they are in some of, of the other owls. Now, what's the other thing that an owl has? The other super sense that an owl has is its sense of hearing. Um, and they can hear, they actually use their sense of hearing to hear the sounds that an animal will make, especially high-pitched sounds. So the sound squeaking of a mouse. That is something that is very much in their range. And they, their ears are actually lopsided. So instead of having their ears equal on both sides, they have one ear higher than the other, or one ear slightly larger on one side than the other. And that helps them to triangulate. So when they hear that squeaking sound, they can turn their head in that direction, they can go tilt their heads up and down, and they can zero in on that sound. And in fact, barn owls, in fact, can um, <coughs> They've noticed that when they're flying, and they're, they're using just their hearing, they keep their head in the direction of the sound that they're hearing, and right before they actually strike, their head gets in the way. If, you, if you've got your head focused in, so they lift their head up, throw their wings back, and throw their talons out right where their head was. And that's how they can make an accurate strike when there's no light for them to see. So they do some pretty amazing things. The other amazing thing about an owl is he has silent flight. So besides just having this great hearing and this great eyesight, he has silent flight. They have special feathers on the outer leading edge of their wings. This is from a barred owl, but you can look at this. It's like a fringe or an eyelash right here on the leading edge of the feathers. That helps the muscle to sound that the, the beating wing makes. Also, owl feathers are soft. When you look at an owl, you always probably are impressed by how soft and fluffy they are. Are they really that soft and fluffy? Yeah, they are. Um, there's a lot of fluff there and not much of a body. We take all the feathers away from an owl and he's really pretty little and pretty funny looking. But uh, those feathers give him a lot of uh, fluff, but they also help to make him quiet and fly, especially that leading edge. So yeah, so this is a barn owl. And uh, these guys are pretty amazing. There's a lot of there's, at, the, at their very least, there's been reports of barn owls being able to um, catch at least one, um, let's see, what it, what it boils down to is 12 mice an hour. So if you figure that up, it equals oh, time. Good. That's uh, a mouse every five minutes, um, you know, so that's uh, pretty amazing. But I read a study, there was a pair of researchers, or a researcher watching a pair of barn owls. By the way, barn owls can have some pretty large broods if you've ever been around. Um, they can have up to 10 babies, but uh, in, a, in a clutch. They had a mom and a dad, and they had seven, seven babies in the nest, and they counted that they brought back 20, was it 24 mice in 26 minutes. Oh, jeez. Crazy. <laughs> Crazy. So if you want them, you want a mousetrap, get a, get a barn owl. And that's one of the things, you know, that, that we are trying to encourage people to get rid of the rodent sites. You know, you want to encourage a barn owl around people since she was very long. And I'll explain, imprinting is, is not that she thinks she's a human, but she thinks all of us are the same thing that she is, you know. She doesn't understand um, where food comes from. She can hunt, but um, it's easier to go beg for food. People. <laughs> and that puts the bird in a bad situation. They end up 
going and doing things that it's not appropriate, they're not afraid of the things they should be afraid of. We've had a number of birds brought to us over the years, we've been doing this for 40 years, but one person raised it, they let it go, it flew down to the next farmhouse and tried to get in the screen door in the back, oh. in the back door. Um, so it wasn't behaving appropriately. It wasn't, it didn't know what it was supposed to do. And, and it's very hard to overcome that when they, uh, once they figure out people are a source of food. And so it doesn't work very well to, to train them to, I mean, it can be done to, but it, it's oftentimes it's, it's not successful. So this bird is part of our program animals because she has been around people since she was very young. She doesn't necessarily like people. I mean, that's not to say she, you know, but you can see that she's uh, definitely. But so does she not, stay at the center? Or she does. Somebody? No, she stays, she lives at the nature center. And uh, she's one of our, yeah. She's, yeah. They're, she, I like to watch her, you can just see the fluid movement that she makes. Um, barn owls or any owl, they never make any jerky motions. Now, barn owls don't make a typical hoo-hoo call. They actually make a scream. And uh, she'll probably have a little bit of a fit with me if I play this call real quick. We'll just play it once. We don't want to make her mad or anything. But here's what they sound like. This is what she does. So they don't really sound like an owl. And um, so there's a lot of... Uh, and these the youngsters, if you see them in a nest, one of the things that they do to oh, oh, whoa. She's, not going she, she's, not, she's not going anywhere. She'll sit down. So one of the things that they'll do with the youngsters in the nest is they'll hiss and they <laughs> like that, and they really make you think they're they're big and bad. Um, and then you saw how lovely, how cute they are. So you imagine that in conjunction with uh, all that noise. Any other questions about her? Yeah. How do they feed their young? I mean, with a beak that big, do they just throw the mice in there and the well, babies are able to? After a point, yes. But when they're really little, they're very good parents. And they, they take the time, they stand on it, and they pull little tiny pieces and feed them little pieces at a time. Oftentimes, they skin it. So they don't feed them the skin at first. They feed them just the meat and the innards and things like that. And uh, then as the chick grows, they start getting more. And after a point, yeah, mom just brings, or dad brings the food, drops it in the nest, and lets them go for it. And uh, that can be good, it can be bad, because sometimes if you need a little of sky in the brood, you might not, you might get out competed. You might not get enough to eat, and you might not survive. Um, but if times are good and the parents are having a good, good time hunting, then they'll raise them all. So. Okay, yeah. Aren't snowy owls diurnal? Snowy owls can be, they're more diurnal than, um, than the, you know, barn owls. Barn owls do tend to be nocturnal. There are some other diurnal owls, like uh, burrowing owls, for example. Um, they are out more active. So owls in general, you can't make a blanket statement. We like to say owls are nocturnal, but not all owls are nocturnal. And some are crepuscular and some are di diurnal. And so, I mean, there is a lot of variation, but uh, in general, they tend to be, you know, the barn owl is one What's of What's diurnal mean? Diurnal means you have during the daytime and you sleep at night like we do. Crepuscular means you like to be most active during dawn and dusk. So low light level condition. And there are some owls that prefer that, so. Um, I've heard the color of their eye will tell you what they are, if they are nocturnal or diurnal. Is that true? Kind of. I mean, I wouldn't, I don't think it holds true for all, you know, I don't think it's a blanket statement for 200 kinds of owls, but in general that does sort of work. Um, but, uh, yeah. Can you successfully create nesting habitat in town for owls? Yes, in town for some owls. Um, barred owls, for example, are, and screech owls. Screech owls are a perfect example for a, a nest box to put up in town. They're small owls, only about eight inches tall. Um, they use the same size box as a kestrel nesting box. It's just where you put the hole and how big you make the hole. It's really the same size box. And uh, screech owls are common in cities because they eat most of the insects. And so 
they have plenty of food to eat, and they'll eat a lot of, like when we get baby screech owls in in the summer, I'm going around and I'm getting all the June bugs I can find from my garage. <laughs> I'm sweeping up piles of them. I'm going to my neighbor's house and getting all the June bugs I can get. I'm like, give me your June bugs. And then I turn my back porch light on at night so they, oh. they hit my house and I go cut them. Because <laughs> I have babies. I have babies to be. <laughs> <laughs> Some owls do and some owls don't. It, it really kind of depends on the owl. Um, screech, or barn owls are not big migrators in the northern parts of their range. One thing about barn owls is they're not unique to North America. They are found in Europe and southern uh, and northern Africa and in Asia. So they have what we call a holoartic distribution. So take the uh, equator and go north of that. You're going to find uh, barn owls throughout the northern hemisphere. And so they are... Um, so you will see mentions of barn owls, for example, in Shakespeare. Shakespeare, and actually, it was a bad thing to have an owl land on your roof in the uh, uh, Middle Ages. It was a, supposed to be a harbinger of death, and so it was said that if an owl landed on your roof, someone in the house would be dead within three days. <laughs> <laughs> you know, nice. But in other cultures, there was, you know, an affinity. You know, uh, it was a good luck thing, and. and uh, there are many Native American tribes that have different uh, beliefs about owls as well. So, so there are a wide variety of, of beliefs about owls in, in general. But yeah, some migrate, some don't. Um, but barn owls don't migrate here in Kansas. They're, but in their northern ranges up towards Canada, they might move around some because of the cold. Um, so let me go ahead and put, put you back. You did pretty good for being in a bad mood today. <laughs> <laughs> she was in a really bad mood. Oh. Okay, so he's not an owl. Might not be as cool as an owl, but but uh, I think. So he's one of my favorite birds, but he's also, is he really a raptor? Is he really a bird of prey? Um, they keep going back and forth about where do vultures fit? And you know, they have that sharp curved beak. You see that beak? That's a beak designed for eating meat. But you look at his feet and you notice he's got like chicken feet. And uh, he really doesn't have the talons on his feet. He doesn't have these sharp claws that are good for grasping and killing. Um, so where does that put the vulture? And we also have to understand there's old world vultures and there's new world vultures. This stuff gets exhausting trying to figure this all out. But old world vultures are a lot more like the eagles that they are related to than new world vultures. This is a new world vulture. New world vultures, there for a while, they were, their closest relatives were storks. Now we're kind of going back to the idea that maybe they are more related to eagles than we thought. Um, there's a lot of genetics being done with birds, as you know, with classifying birds. And, so the more genetic studies that are done, the more it can tell us about how they relate to other birds, it's the clades and things like that. So is, is he a bird of prey? Well, he eats meat and he's ornery. Um, and I think he probably, there he's gonna show you those beautiful wings. So, so turkey vultures, this is a turkey vulture. This is one of two kinds of vultures that can be seen within the boundaries of Kansas, but you're never probably gonna see very many. So the other vultures up here, Black vultures, the other vulture. Uh, turkey vultures have a red head. Black vultures have a black head. And uh, black vultures are a little bit smaller. And they're found, they're in the southeast part of the state, the southern part of the state, but they seldom get up here. I wouldn't say that it could never happen, but uh, turkey vultures are the ones that are common around here. And turkey vultures are migratory birds. So these guys are only here in um, the summer, spring and summer. And it's already February. I bet by the middle of March, we'll probably see some of our first turkey vultures back up this way, especially as warm, you know, if we get some good warm weather. I'm um, usually in February, I head down south to a meeting, I an annual meeting that I go to, and it's usually in the south. And it's always, you always see turkey vultures in the, in the end of February uh, when we go down to Texas or in, in Oklahoma or someplace like that. So turkey vultures are here. They, they leave Kansas in about the oh, first part of November usually. Uh, maybe the end of October, depends on the weather. Uh, they don't like Kansas when it gets cold because believe it or not, it's their feet 
that get frostbite very easily. Notice they have this bare leg. Um, so a turkey vulture is a scavenger. He's Mother Nature's garbage crew. There's not a Malemba bird out there that's as well adjusted for eating carrion or dead things as this guy is. So you look, you can see that he's got a great big hole in his beak. Look all the way through, you can see to the other side. Of course, animals that have a big schnoz usually means they have a pretty good sense of smell. And that's true for this guy, except he's a bird. How many birds do you know that have a good sense of smell? Very few have a good sense of smell. There are a few, and we're starting to learn more and more about birds and their sense of smell. But in general, we've, we've believed for years that birds don't have a very good sense of smell. Um, the exceptions is the turkey vulture here. He can detect the rotten, the, the sulfides from rotten meat, and uh, that is how he finds his food, or oftentimes that's one of the ways he finds his food. He has good eyesight. He can spot something dead from a mile away. Wow. Um, so it's not that he can't see it, but he uses his sense of smell to help him tell if it's something he wants to eat or not. Because his beak, while it's sharp, it's not strong. He doesn't have the ability to rip something apart, and so he has to let it rot for a while. And then he has a better chance of getting it. Now, if you're going to eat something like that, you're probably going to get kind of messy and dirty. You don't want to be dirty or messy because that's not healthy. So vultures don't have feathers on their head in order to stay clean. And the common misconception is that a vulture is a dirty bird, but he's really not. Uh, vultures spend a lot of time cleaning themselves. They have lots of ways of keeping themselves clean. Uh, one of the things that they do, have you ever seen them sun themselves on a summer morning up on the top of a barn or a hay bale or something like that? These dark feathers get very hot when you, when you um, sit in the sunlight like that, and it helps to rid them of parasites. Another thing, this is a lovely, lovely little tidbit you can share with your friends at brunch tomorrow. Um, vultures poop on their legs. The reason why, their legs are actually pink, but you'll never see a vulture with a pink leg because you'll see that they're always whitewashed. That's because they poop on their leg. That helps to kill any bacteria that they might get from standing on top of a carcass or something else. So there's all kinds of great things that vultures can do. Um, so that's why they are always whitewashed like that. The other thing that's lovely about a vulture is how many people have ever gotten too close to a vulture? Who knows the secret to it? How does a vulture defend itself? Any ideas? <laughs> uh, well, I heard it. Projectile. Pro projectile <laughs> vomit, that's right. So if you think it smells bad the first time they eat it, <laughs> you don't want to be around when it comes up. And let me, I'll give you a little clue here. Because of that, they get carsick very quickly. So oh. it can sometimes be fun to take the vulture to a program. <laughs> because he doesn't always keep down. We, we've learned over the years that if we're going to use him in a program, don't feed him until you're done with the program, <laughs> and then you can feed him. Um, so he's ready. He'll get fed tonight when I get back um, because we didn't want to have to stop and change the papers in the pet program. I will tell you a story. I went to a, I went through a drive-thru. Um, one time, I, I'm nose blind, of course, now after all these years. It doesn't bother me. And I had, the program was the Unhuggables, which is the skunk and the vulture. And I drove through this McDonald's drive through and no, no. have the skunk in the back and have the vulture in the back. And I'm not thinking anything about it. And the girl hands me my bag and she's like, blows backwards. <laughs> and I'm sure she's still telling stories about that that state vehicle that came through here. This lady, you would stunk like crazy. <laughs> and she was eating in it. <laughs> but anyway, um, I didn't have to go back through. That was some town I never would take him. <laughs> but um, so yeah, he can be kind of a smelly guy sometimes. But uh, let me show you, see those six foot wingspan? So he has about a six foot wingspan. Makes him one of our largest birds in Kansas. So an eagle and a vulture have the same wingspan. An eagle is actually a bigger bird and a larger body. So who has the better wing load? Big wing, little body, who can fly better? Vulture. Vulture can fly better. Vultures are beautiful when they fly and gorgeous. And you watch them and they ride those thermals, which are air currents that are rising from the ground. They get heated up, they spin around. And the vultures just get in on those and they glide. And they can literally glide for hours on those big wings. And 
and uh, yeah, while they're up there, they're taking the drafts, and they're, they're acting like they're having fun. They always look to me like they're having fun. Um, we see them sometimes over the dam at Milford Lake, and they just swoop down. They get caught in a draft or a downdraft, and they swoop down, and they're, they're almost right across the top of the car as you go across the dam. Um, you can fly right next to them, or they'll fly right next to you. So, I don't know, they always look to me like they're having a good time. But uh, you're actually gotten kind of heavy, you know that? <laughs> he weighs about five pounds, so try holding five pounds in your hand for 20 minutes and you'll get a good idea. I'm going to have to start doing this. <laughs> okay, we're getting fat. Yeah. Is you a heavy bird? You're a heavy bird. So, yeah. What about altitude? How high do they range? Well, um, they, they can go very high. They can go 20,000 feet. There's been documentation of them um, that high and actually airplane strikes or a few things, a few like that, but um, not very often. But they do, they can go really high. And uh, Isn't that fairly unique for birds? Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, birds have a whole different way of breathing than we do. You know, they have lungs that are, are connected, it's air sacs in their body that kind of take up space and it's a really unique way of, of breathing. It actually takes two breaths to get one breath compared, you know, to compared to our one breath. But it's more efficient too. And so, because it's more efficient, and the way the oxygen is pushed through their body, they can survive in, in a higher altitude than, than we would be able to. Um, but yeah, I think there are. It's not obviously the turkey vulture, but there's a there's a vulture that can be found on Mount Everest that you can see off. Of Pretty amazing up there. Uh, any other questions? Does he speak? Does, Does he? Speak? Speak? No, that's a great thing. Vultures are voiceless. They don't have a syrinx. Okay, so they make no sounds. He can hiss, and uh, but they have no voice box, so they can't make a sound. I didn't think I heard them. You know? Yeah, they don't make any noise. They don't call or anything like that. But uh, when they're threatened, they will hiss. So. What do you? <laughs> I mean, do you hang around with yeah, no. <laughs> no, no. The good thing about them being in captivity is they'll, they'll eat fresh stuff, too. They don't have to have it dead. Um, although I will tell you another story. I, I read in a book, so Bent's Natural History, anybody familiar with Bent Natural Histories of Birds? It was written in the early 1900s. And I read in there that here's the line. It said, Vultures find snakes a particular delicacy. That's what it said, word for word. I'm like, oh. So the next snake I found on the road that would have been killed, it, was a, it happened to be a bull snake, and it was a pretty good size one. So I took it back, and I put it in the cage of the vulture, and I thought, oh, he's going to love this. This is such good enrichment. He's going to love it. He didn't love it. He didn't like it at all, and he hissed at it, and he stayed away on the opposite side of the cage for a couple of days, and... Uh, he never did eat it, and then it seemed like ever since that time, um, when I ever got when we get a snake out or something, he just hisses and doesn't like it. So, so he does. This particular vulture doesn't find snakes a delicacy, <laughs> but but he will eat just about anything we give him. And, and they do like he does like um, oh squirrels and road kills and things like that. Like I do service the roads. <laughs> My daughter is like, oh, don't pick that up. <laughs> she had her friends in the car and we're going somewhere and they're like, mom, no, no, don't pick that up. My friends are in the car. <laughs> I tormented my kids. <laughs> in the person, we, twice a year we have one in the water tower, right? Oh, yeah. In the middle of town, like 50 of them. Yeah. During the migration. I was right. Well, they're very social birds. That's one of the other ways that they're different than than raptors or what you know what you think of as eagles and hawks and things because they do live they're social they live in groups they hunt together they roost together they um, so you find them in, in big groups even and uh, so it's not uncommon to see 50 or 60 of them and uh, around Fort Riley there is a spot that the vultures still come to even though the Calvary mort pit the mort pits for the dead horses from the Calvary are no haven't haven't been there for 100 years but they still congregate in that area where the old Morton pit used to be. Mm -hmm. Something about their food.
include, uh, we visited these Big Bend uh, uh, National Park, and they're the scavenger. Yeah. Yeah. We'll be at a picnic table, and they'll be over at the next one cleaning up the people. Yeah. They, uh, they say that the only live prey that they have ever documented vultures taking are some babies, baby animals. Um, they have been known to eat, like, I guess there's records of them eating, like, baby piglets and things like that, but it doesn't happen very often. Um, and there was one record of them eating salamanders at one time. So, so they will eat a few other things, but in general, it needs to be um, dead and, and a little bit uh, old for them to, to really enjoy it, right? Age. So why did he end up being aged? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, both the birds I brought tonight are are imprints, so they're the same same problem. This one has been around people since he was very young, and I, honestly, that's really the only way to can have a vulture for education. If I brought a vulture, if we had a vulture that had been injured and it had a broken wing, and we tried to bring it into a room like this, he would vomit, and then you would leave. <laughs> <laughs> so it just doesn't work out. <laughs> So we have to. Uh, How closely related to the condors are they? They are the New World vulture. The condor is a New World vulture as well. So it's just it's the largest. It's bigger. It's bigger. The, yeah. the biggest yeah. one of the New World vultures is the king king vulture, which is South American, or Andean condor, which is actually South American. They're real pretty. Yeah. That's a good looking. Uh, how long do they stay in a family unit? Well, as far as with their, you know. Um, they are social, so as far as they're not uh, terribly territorial, but the nesting parents, or with the pair, they nest on the ground, by the way. So they don't build nests up in a tree or anything like that. They will use a shelf or a ledge or something on occasion, but usually the places that they like to go are buildings that are about to fall over, an old barn that's about to fall over. I, my daughter was down at our farm, and, and we have a shed in the back, and there's a mower there, and there's a pack rat nest that actually literally covers the mower. Push mower, any kind of <coughs> but then to the side of that, she goes, Mom, she called me up, she says, Mom, what are these? And she took a picture, and I'm like, it was a vulture nest. So they had, they had nested in that shed. But they nest on the ground, and they'll use like a hollow log or a dead tree or something like that that's over or an old building or something like that. Um, and then, so when they're nesting, it's just usually the parents and the chicks, but once they fledge, when they go, as far as their family unit, I'm not sure that they have a fidelity to just the mom and dad and siblings. So they, once they're with the rest of the vultures, it's just vultures are social. And they like to hang out with the them. reason I was asking, I've seen some programs where they've talked about the intelligence of the crow and the crow yeah. do hang together yes, they do. longer periods and seem to learn, and they may mention that. Yeah. I was thinking, hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, yeah, crows are by far, so far, exhibiting highest intelligence of, of any bird. And uh, we also have a crow at the major center. Her name is Corvette, and she's, she's quite a challenge to keep her, keep her active and happy and in, intrigued and all of those things. And yes, she recognizes people. She knows, she knows people. She knows what they're wearing. I mean, she can, she's, she's amazing. She's pretty, pretty, pretty incredible. Our, you're, you're my favorite bird, but. Is this one named? His name is Lurch. Lurch. This is Lurch. How, how long have you had Lurch? Um, Lurch, how old are you? I think Lurch is about 14. But he could live to be 20 or 25 in captivity. Now, in the wild, he would be probably at his maximum. I mean, a 14, 15 year old vulture is probably about as long as they live, but maybe not. I mean, they can live, certainly live longer. Larger birds live longer um, than smaller birds in general. But um, there's always exceptions to that. But uh, so, and the vulture, you know, we've I've had vultures that live to be over 20. Uh, I'm hoping that he'll live a long, healthy life. Yeah. 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 And he, you know, you get him outside. These feathers are iridescent. You really can't see it under the fluorescent yeah. light. But there's blues and greens and purples in his feathers. And you get them out in the sunlight, and it's just really pretty to see those feathers. And of course, as soon as he gets out in the sun, he, he likes to put his wings out and sun himself. But he's not going to do that now because he's inside. Do imprinted birds appreciate touch or petting? Or? You know, that's a good question. Um, they tolerate it 
you know, more than, than wild birds do. Uh, we generally don't touch the birds very often because it just gives the wrong impression of them. You know, because they aren't pets, but they are used to being around people. Um, so he doesn't seem to to really. He likes to bark, <laughs> and he likes to. Um, he has a shoot day, so he's like, if you work for me and you're new, we send you into the vulture cage. Get out, all right, then you can stay. <laughs> if you're not terrified of the vulture at your feet trying it's to untie your shoe, <laughs> then it's okay. Sure, not your shoes. Yeah, he's, he just, they just have a thing for feet and shoes and, and shoestring and things like that. So he can be a scary bird. Yeah. We have a question. Over yeah, here. yeah, yeah. Um, how do they protect the chicks? How do, yeah. Well, you know, when you're too young to fly, um, you got to have mom and dad take care of you. And, and what they do is they throw up on intruders. So if you get too close to them, they will throw up on you. And trust me, it's pretty nasty. <laughs> and they aim for the face. Uh, it doesn't do any permanent damage, but, but they try to do whatever they can to get you to, to leave their babies alone. Uh, so, yeah, it works out. Oops. Yes, mine too. <laughs> yes. They are pretty. They are pretty. Um, they're, they're really interesting. So, anybody, any other questions? I, I just brought a few things from the Bird of Prey box if you want to look at things. Um, and uh, a few that's, pictures and that's things. That's your presentation. I mean, you're going from trying to get them back in the nest or back in the box. Right. You have to do it <laughs> as best as you, as quick as you can. Um, I think you, it still took a while to build that nest, didn't it? No, we did that in, in three hours. They were back in the nest by that afternoon, by 5 o'clock. Um, and they had come to me at 10 o'clock in the morning. So that one was a great turnaround. Usually on the nest building and things like that, you you do it at, you know, as fast as you can because you don't know if mom will lose fidelity with the nest. I mean, if she feels like her young are gone, she may go away and, and not come back. But there is, there's a stronger desire to protect their babies or raise their babies. Nobody gives up on their babies. You wouldn't give up on your baby in a day, you know, and, and neither do bird parents. They don't give up on their babies. Oh, they're gone. I'm going to move on. They stick around for quite a while, but you still you need to do it as fast as you can. And then when we have birds that um, aren't, we're not putting them back, but one of our biggest problems are Mississippi kites because Mississippi kites migrate. And so they don't get, and, and they, they're late nesters. They're younger on the ground in August. They leave in September. It's hard to get people to leave them alone. They nest in towns. They get it on people's decks. They end up in places, the golf courses and city parks and things, and people won't leave them alone. And just leave them alone. They'll be fine. If there's a parent nearby, they'll be fine. The thing that few people really understand is that all baby birds spend some time on the ground. Nobody learns to fly by jumping off the nest and flying away like they do in Disney movies, okay? Mm -hmm. You land on the ground and you hop back up on this bush and you get on this bush and you get up on this bush and you try it again. And you hop back up and you get back up and, and you keep trying it out until you finally get it where you fly. Very few birds just take off and fly right away. They usually take a short glide down to the ground, and then they have to start this whole process over again. And that's where the problem comes in. People interfere in that spot. They're, I mean, they could be on the ground for up to a week sometimes, but they're definitely more vulnerable during that time. There's predators that can get them, and they can become, they get in the wrong places, and all of those things are certainly a problem, but parents, that's what the parents are there for, you know, to help them. But if you can't convince people, so anyway, with, with Mississippi kites, they go all the way down to South America, and they're not going to go by themselves. And so we have actually literally followed a kettle of Mississippi kites all the way into Oklahoma to let birds go. Because they got, they were here the day today, and they were gone the next day. And we're like, Ugh, oh no. And so we, we talk to our birding friends, and we talk to people, and we're like, well, we're, and we find out, well, they're in Wichita right now. There's a kettle in Wichita. So we drive to Wichita to release these birds so that they'll be with their own kind so that they can get to where they need to be. 
because they won't survive otherwise. And holding them over for another until spring, that takes a lot of food, it takes a lot of time, and it risks them becoming very used to being around people. So, anyway. <laughs> Anybody? Well, with that, I won't, I can, I can get Lurch out again if you guys want to, any of you want to see him. Again. I'll put him up for a, a few minutes, and then if anybody wants to see him up close. Is, is he allowed to fly at all? Please? He has a, they are free lofted in their cages. So they all have cages that allow them some flight. His, his pen is not as big as a flight pen, for example. So he can fly in his cage, but he can't fly great distances. He can't fly away. He can't fly. So he does, he only wears the dresses for programs. That's just for when we bring him inside and we want to be safe and comfortable. But when he's in his cage, he's free lofted for he doesn't have any more. So. Yeah, if your kiddos want to come down and see him after the evening, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good, don't it?